the fuel crisis. Let's start off with a quick reminder of what is fuel. Fuel is the lifeblood of the narcissist and is provided essentially by an emotional reaction provided by an individual that the narcissist is interacting with. There is proximate fuel, which is what we prefer, where we witness firsthand your reaction. It might be what you write in a text message or what you say to us down the telephone line or how you behave when you're stood next to us. There is also thought fuel. This is weak and ephemeral and can't last for long, but this is where we envisage your reaction where we don't see you. If you want to understand more about fuel, and this is critical to your understanding about narcissism, please utilise my book, Fuel, which you will find on Amazon or in the Knowledge Vault. We need fuel. Fuel is our lifeblood. Fuel is of such significance because, first of all, it powers the construct. It also, although not always, provides the provision by signalling control to us. Fuel is important to the narcissist because it starts to fill the emptiness that exists within. That chasm, that abyss is present within every narcissist. Certain narcissists are much better at dealing with the effects of that chasm than others. The Greaters and the Ultra have such extensive fuel matrices, so many fuel lines pumping that delicious fuel towards us, that the effects of the chasm are rarely felt at all. That howling wilderness is not something that we expressly experience on a regular basis. But it remains, and we know it is there. But, as a consequence of the way that our narcissism has evolved, our ability, our talents, the various appliances that we plug into us, such is the flow of fuel, that the risk of a fuel crisis for the greater and ultra is virtually impossible. It is a different situation for the lessers and the mid-rangers. Understand this. And I have witnessed this many times in the narcissists that I have observed, interacted with, listened to. They are aware of the presence of this chasm in this abyss, although they don't know what it actually is. It is there a lot of the time for them, but they don't realise that's what it is, because it manifests in a different way to them. When the lesser and mid-range narcissist is well-fueled, and of course this is applicable to all narcissists, but the shift in fuel provision is more marked and happens more regularly for the lesser and mid-range, so therefore I shall talk about them. When they're well-fueled, they feel powerful, invulnerable, impregnable, fizzing with energy capable of achieving much, energised. This might manifest as being excitable, outgoing, fun. In other instances, this might power more malign behaviours that are meted out as against appliances with energy and conviction. But as that fuel level falls, the chasm the abyss, the nothingness, starts to make its presence felt. It begins as a faint feeling of unease, uncertainty. Something's not quite right. The unease increases as the fuel levels drop. The uncertainty becomes greater. Anxiety forms. A nervousness, a sense of something going to go wrong, and as the fuel levels plummet, that sense becomes one of foreboding, dread, as if the floor of the earth might fall out beneath the narcissist and the walls come crashing in upon him. His energy levels drop, he's anxious concerned. 
the creature is calling and is now being heard as the construct slowly starts to become dismantled. When those few levels begin to drop, that is what the narcissist begins to feel. But as the fuel comes back, it acts like some pouring oil on troubled waters, a soothing balm, whereby the desperation and the dread eases. The narcissist's fuel levels climb, and he moves away from that feeling of impending doom, a feeling of nothingness. Instead, that dread recedes to perhaps something closer to a mild unease. And the more the fuel levels climb, it has a settling effect. The anxiety vanishes, the concern evaporates, the yawning chasm's presence becomes less well felt and recedes into the distance. And as the fuel levels climb even higher, the narcissist becomes more assertive, more confident, appearing almost settled, almost content. But then, if they start to drop again, and they do, that chasm starts to reappear again. And thus, the narcissist, particularly lesser and mid-range, oscillates between these states. And this is why, and you should gain some degree of comfort and assurance from this, that even though you might think, well, the narcissist has disengaged from me and has moved on, and he's posting all of these pictures on, of him on this sun lounger, enjoying the Mediterranean sun with the person that he's run off with, leaving me behind in the cold and the wet and the wind and with the debts and feeling miserable. Recognise this. For all of the outward appearance of that individual of being happy, and remember, we don't actually do happy, it is just the manifestation of the fuel that we are receiving that makes us look happy to you. What we're experiencing is the fuel. Inside, that narcissist cannot rest for long. His narcissism is always fighting to assert control, always seeking out that next provision of fuel, keeping the chasm at bay. It is a ceaseless and endless task. And for those of us at the higher echelons, it does not create such a concern because the fuel is always flowing in our direction and so effectively. But for those who are lower echelon, they feel the chilling presence of that chasm repeatedly and regularly, draining their energy, creating that unease. And whilst you might think that he's happy as Larry, happy as a pig in shit, he's not. First, he doesn't do happiness, and moreover, beneath that veneer of apparent pleasure and delight, the chasm is waiting, the creature is calling. That unease and that dread will start to surface, and therefore something must be done to draw more fuel. The narcissism responds instinctively to keep those fuel levels as high as it possibly can, and to keep the narcissist away. But recognise that need never goes. There is no contentment. Imagine that ceaseless sensation ranging between confidence and then despair, and in between. That is what the daily existence of a lesser or mid-range narcissist will feel like, but they don't understand what it is. That restlessness, the itch that needs to be scratched, it's there, waiting to be addressed, and thus their ceaseless quest for fuel causes them to continue to draw on it from the various appliances. But what happens when those fuel levels really plummet and we get into the realms of the fuel crisis? This will occur when no fuel is being provided, existing levels are low, and there is repeated and sustained wounding. Why is this problematic? Well, first of all, if existing fuel levels are low, the narcissist is, is courting danger, skirting with catastrophe. If his fuel levels, for the sake of example, were up at 70 or 80 percent, then whilst wounding is a problem because it threatens our control and we're not being provided with fuel, it is not going to catapult him into a fuel crisis. 
his fuel levels will dip 70, 60, 50%. There's still no major issue. Around 50%, the unease starts to make itself felt. But his narcissism will gird itself and crank into action, asserting control and drawing fuel to deal with the wounding by causing the narcissist to assert control and end that wounding, and then draw fuel to heal the wound caused by that wounding, and thus the fuel levels climb once more. Danger and catastrophe readily averted. The unease was all that was experienced, and the narcissist moves away from it once again. But if, for whatever reason, those fuel levels are much lower, perhaps starting off in the realm of 40 or 30 percent, then danger beckons. Already the narcissist is feeling the unease and the dread because that fuel level is at a lower level. This might have been, for instance, that the narcissist has not had any interaction with somebody for some time. And therefore the fuel levels have naturally dropped. And then, if you are not providing any additional fuel, then the fuel level starts to steadily erode. Like a car idling on its engine, it is still using up some fuel. If, however, the narcissist is being wounded, and therefore his fury is igniting, that fuel is being eaten up at an alarming rate, and the fuel level drops. If you want to understand more about this, read my excellent book, Fury. And therefore, when a narcissist is experiencing no or limited fuel provision, combined with repeated or sustained wounding, this drives the narcissist towards a fuel crisis. It is a double blow against the narcissist. Wounding is the worst thing that you can ever do to us. And if you want to understand what wounding actually is, go to the Knowledge Vault and obtain the three interactions with the narcissist or finally understanding wounding, or both, if you really want to graduate with honours. But wounding is that double blow against us. No fuel, and it threatens our control. Of course, we obtain our fuel from all of the different people in our fuel matrix. Primary sources, secondary sources, both intimate and non-intimate, tertiary sources, both intimate and non-intimate. Strangers, acquaintances, friends, family, colleagues, lovers, mistresses, side pieces, friends with benefits, wives, husbands, boyfriends, girlfriends, uncles, aunties. The stranger on the corner of the street, the man selling hot dogs newspaper vendor. All of them are potential and relevant parts of our fuel matrices. If the narcissist's fuel matrix has started to fall apart and there is a reduced fuel level because of this and then there is sustained and repeated wounding, the fuel level will drop drastically. For instance, if a primary source escapes and does so without any further interaction with the narcissist. This causes massive wounding. Not only will the narcissist have lost a massive chunk of his fuel matrix, for instance, a lesser narcissist, 90% of his fuel will probably come from the primary source. And if you want to understand more about the changes to the fuel matrix, obtain changes to the fuel matrix, which you will find in the Knowledge Vault. You'll find that very interesting. If that lesser narcissist, for instance, a lower lesser or a middle lesser, has lost that primary source. Not only have they lost 90% of their fuel matrix, but the loss of that primary source is massive wounding in itself, and therefore their fuel levels are plummeting. They will be forced to scramble to the supplementary sources, secondary and tertiary, clamoring to get fuel from them, but it may not be enough. And what if those secondary sources have been alienated because of that lower lesser or middle lesser's behaviour? The family who are sick and tired of being called assholes and bastards. The friends who are sick and tired of the violent outbursts of that lower lesser. And remember, they have a small fuel matrix to begin with. In those instances, the loss of that primary source who is so important to the narcissist is causing the narcissist to have to go into chaos mode to try and fight to get that primary source back through the initial Grand Hoover, which of course takes up energy. Energy that is dwindling with his dwindling fuel levels. And therefore, he may well be catapulted into a fuel crisis. A fuel crisis occurs where the narcissist has invariably a low fuel level to start with, combined with the fuel matrix falling apart, usually 
the loss of the primary source. This affects lesser narcissists and mid-range narcissists far more than greaters and the ultra because lesser and mid-range narcissists rely on the primary source for most of their fuel, between 70 and 90 percent. And as I explained, and understanding changes to the fuel matrix gives you more idea about the different constituent fuel matrices of different subschools of narcissists so you can understand what proportions are obtained from who. But this fuel crisis originates from existing low fuel levels, the loss of a primary source, and in effect evasive, difficult or disinterested secondary sources who will not come to the aid of the narcissist to the extent that is required. The narcissist is forced to try and look for new ones, but they're struggling. Their energy is being compromised because of the low fuel, and therefore they start to enter a downward spiral. And when that fuel level drops so that it takes them into a fuel crisis, what happens? The narcissist becomes someone who engages in self-neglect. Their hygiene deteriorates. They don't brush their teeth or shower. They don't change their clothing. They don't notice that they start to smell. They don't notice the egg stains on the front of their polo shirt. They once might have been smart and presentable, but now they are just in the sloppy joes, the track pants, the t-shirt. There is withdrawal. Caught between trying to protect themselves from further wounding, driven by the narcissism which now starts to misfire, but also the need to try and gain fuel, they end up isolating, withdrawing from the world, trying to protect themselves, governed by the instinctive narcissism from further wounding. But this is a self-sabotaging act, because the withdrawal prevents them from gaining the required fuel. The way to liken it is to somebody who has got hypothermia, and they are often invariably, they become confused, disorientated, and sometimes believe that they're overheating and remove their clothing, which makes the situation worse. That is what happens to the narcissist in fuel crisis. Before fuel crisis, the narcissism will guide him towards the assertion of control and gathering of additional fuel. But once in fuel crisis, it backfires, and there is a downward spiral. As the narcissism misfires, and implements its protective element by keeping the narcissist away from further wounding, but by so doing, cutting the narcissist off from the further provision of fuel, hunting it out. The narcissist may engage in self-harm, cutting, burning. The narcissist may lash out at people, thus forcing them away, again, akin to somebody perhaps when they're drunk who has fallen and has injured themselves, and then uh, an attending paramedic tries to help, not realising that this is actually help that's being provided, the drunk lashes out, striking the paramedic. The narcissist can do the same, that in certain instances they perceive, through the obscuring of their narcissistic perspective and the fact that they are in a fuel crisis, that when people are just trying to help them, they lash out and push them away. The narcissist becomes haphazard. The narcissist might turn to drink and drugs by way of them being temporary fuel substitutes to try and stave off. If the descent continues and there is not sufficient intervention by individuals who will provide fuel and arrest the fuel crisis and then allow the narcissist to move back upwards out of the fuel crisis, then the narcissist will descend into psychosis, collapse, potentially suicide. And all the while, when they've entered this fuel crisis, the chasm is engulfing them. The darkness, the emptiness, the void is reaching out. And what sits within that void, waiting for them, it is the creature. The fuel crisis for a narcissist is not a common event, but it does occur, and it is more common with the lesser narcissists, particularly lower lesser, middle lesser, and of the mid-range, lower mid-range, but it could happen, theoretically, to any narcissist. It's highly unlikely, for greater and the ultra, for reasons I've already advanced, very unusual to occur to upper mid-range, unusual for middle mid-range. But, thereafter, 
other types of narcissists are likely to find themselves in a position whereby they run the risk of fuel crisis, particularly predicated on the loss of the primary source and if they have alienated other sources also. That becomes a difficulty for them. They end up reducing their own options because of previous behaviour which is held against them. And the fuel crisis looms. I have witnessed this with members of my family and other narcissists besides, which I may deal in future videos. But understand, the fuel crisis is a risk to a narcissist. And when it happens, it pans out in the way that I have described. I'm H.G. Tudor. Thank you for listening.